Thank you, Zintar, and thanks you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure uh, and to be here on a very nice day. Um, as Zintar said, this is uh, about some work that we're doing in analyzing the climate data. Let me start with some uh, motivation. Uh, so climate change is, uh, is, is one of the most important issues that's facing our society. Um, the planet is warming. Uh, we have multiple lines of evidence. Uh, and the scientific community, for the most part, believes that there's a very credible link to the human greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And uh, people realize, the scientific community realizes that the consequences can be dire. Uh, we're already seeing a uh, frequency of extreme weather events, increasing uh, regional and, and climate ecosystem shifts. There could be possibilities of abrupt climate change and stress on green resources and infrastructures. You know, if the intensity of hurricanes increase, you know, it sort of puts, a, uh, puts a, a lot of people in danger. If you look at this uh, picture on the right side here, it, it, it's one of the most recent events that we all became too aware of. This, this was the massive heat wave in Russia uh, caused uh, a lot of forest fires. Uh, and, and to the right of it, you see the shrinking ice caps. And initially, the scientists were uh, expecting the ice caps to melt by 20, 2050. And it's expected to be melting much, much faster than that. And, and so far, we only have seen uh, the, the temperature change uh, of about half a degree to 3.35 degree over the last 50 years. And the projections are for much greater increase in the change in the temperature, which means the, the possibility of uh, uh, devastation or, or serious action, uh, serious consequences is very, very large. So as a result, there's a big urgency. Uh, and, and then there's a focus on two items. One of them is how do we adapt, given that there will be uh, changes in the climate. How do you manage the unavoidable? What something is going to happen uh, in terms of climate change, how do you adapt to it? And the other is mitigate. That is, how do you avoid the unmanageable, given that um, some adaptations are not going to be possible? How do you make sure that you uh, um, reduce the possibility of climate change to the extent, uh, to the extent it's feasible? And, and there is a, um, uh, there are actions being thought about in both of these directions, uh, and yet there is very little action in place. Uh, there's a lot of inaction, there's a lot of talk, and there's a lot of discussion, but not much action. And then the, and the reason is that the cost of doing something about climate change is extremely high, and the cost of not doing is also extremely high. The cost of doing something means changing our lifestyle, changing the energy use, uh, relying less on the, the fossil fuel. Uh, and, and that's just, just very, very expensive. That's not uh, easy to do. Uh, and, and of course, if you do nothing, then there are risks involved. And then the, uh, uh, because many believe in the scientific community that, that ours may be the last generation to, to be able to do something about it. So the key uh, science challenge for the scientific community is how do you provide actionable, predictive insight that can inform the policy ma maker in a credible way, as opposed to having you know, heated debates. And, 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 and much more closer to home, to us in computer science, the question is, what can we, as computer scientists, add to this debate? How can we help uh, uh, the society in this, in this big challenge that's facing them? Uh, how do we sort of inform this debate that sort of goes on always, you know, should we do something? Is the climate changing? Is it not changing? Is it going to have an impact? Is it what kind of impact and so forth? So, so this, this talk is about the, the, the opportunities uh, for those of us in computer science uh, to be able to contribute uh, uh, to, this, to this big issue that's facing the, the society. Now, it turns out that um, as we are facing uh, this big challenge, uh, this also opens up lots of opportunities for us in computer science to basically walk on the path of uh, data-driven knowledge discovery. And it is made possible by the fact that the ecosystem sciences uh, and the climate science has made a transformation from being extremely data poor, you know, if you look back about 30, 40 years ago, very little data available in, in a usable form, to an extremely uh, data-rich state. And how is the data coming from? It's coming from lots of sensors. Uh, more and more sensors are being developed and placed with technology improvement, especially with the satellites. We have a lot of uh, data globally. 
but even otherwise, we have a lot of data from aerial sensors other than satellite and in situ centers that are being, being developed, uh, like weather stations and, and, and other measurements. And then we have a lot of data from the uh, model simulations, the scientific uh, simulations, the physics-based simulations generate massive amount of data and, and, uh, and along with observed uh, data that's collected from the sensors. Together, all of these data uh, allow us opportunity to perform a data-guided discovery as opposed to uh, the traditional paradigm in science, which is a hypothesis-driven discovery. And uh, in many ways, uh, uh, it's the data-driven paradigm is being considered as the fourth paradigm for uh, scientific discovery. And if you look at it, the ancient, the, 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 the original paradigms are theory and experimentation. You theorize about an idea and you do experiment, and, and those are the two paradigms of scientific uh, discovery. And more recently, in the last uh, few decades, uh, computational simulation is considered as the third leg of uh, uh, the third paradigm of scientific discovery uh, because a lot of time you're not able to build a perfect model but you're able to simulate uh, uh, the behavior in, in a using a computational framework. But more recently now uh, the data-driven paradigm is, is being considered as, 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 a, as a key to, uh, to scientific discovery. And we, we see action, we see the data-driven paradigm in action in many, many places without even actually realizing it. Uh, if you yeah, look at places like the Google, or the Amazon, uh, .com, they collect a lot of data about us. And then using the data, they build models, uh, or they actually, without building models, using the data, they're able to, to take actions that are much more informative. So for example, you can use Google to do translation of document, and apparently many of those translations are much more accurate than even using, the done using much more sophisticated uh, models and theories uh, based upon linguistics uh, that you would do uh, on very limited data. So, so this data-driven paradigm, which is being used very successfully in many, many other aspects of, of, of scientific and commercial world, can be brought to, uh, to bear uh, in, in, in the climate science. So, uh, so this talk is about, uh, of course, using this fourth paradigm uh, in support of the issues that are facing us uh, in, in the climate uh, sciences. And uh, since this talk is about discovery of knowledge from this data, uh, uh, it, it sort of, it's good to reflect as to what sort of challenges, what sort of um, difficulties is posed for us in terms of research. And, and because data mining uh, or analysis from, from large data is, is, is a discipline that people have been pursuing for a long time. Uh, so the nature of the eco-climate data actually brings in additional challenges that go beyond uh, the traditional uh, data types. And that is, most of this data happens to be spatiotemporal. Uh, so you're seeing a little bit of an animation here of temperature, uh, uh, of the global temperature uh, uh, for different months. And, and, and so data uh, uh, for the climate happens to be like this is geocoded data for, for different time points, and you have multiple variables. So, and then this data happens to be available at multiple scale, multiple resolution. Uh, data tends to be very, very large uh, at, and it, because it's available at multiple uh, resolution, the size depends on what resolution you're looking at. You literally can talk about petabytes of data uh, for a very short amount of time. NASA collects, for example, for one of the satellites, multiple terabytes of data every day. Uh, uh, so, so you can sort of see the data growing very, very large. So data is very high dimensional because a lot of variables uh, and a lot of this eco-climate data can be very noisy, could have missing values, uh, could have relationships that are much more complex that you can imagine in, uh, in other situations. Could be long range relationships between different parts of the world, long memory relationships. The, the relationship could be delayed. The relationship can be linear, non-linear, non-stationary, and there may be need for fusing multiple sources of data. So all of these uh, aspects of the, the data create a lot of interesting research challenges, which of course make it you know, for good research in computer science. So I'm gonna give you uh, a couple of uh, illustrative applications of data mining uh, related to climate. Uh, one of these happened to be related to the aspect of mitigation, that is how do you reduce the greenhouse gas emission or how do you balance the, 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 the globe's carbon budget. And in that context, uh, this project is about monitoring of the global forest cover with the intent of preserving them. 
And the other uh, is uh, on the uh, understanding the impact of climate change using data-driven methods. So uh, I'll try to give you a flavor of both of these projects. There are two separate projects, although they're highly related, but they're funded separately, and they, they both involve very strongly spatial temporal data mining, and there are sort of illustrations of what computer scientists could do to address this, this issue. So, so project number one is about monitoring the, the forest cover, and the question is why should we be interested in monitoring the global forest cover? And of course, forests are a critical component of the planet um, because for, for a number of reasons. They are home to a lot of biodiversity. Um, they serve as a lung for the global climate system. Uh, for example, the large rainforest in the Amazon uh, are, are believed to regulate the climate as far up as North America. So we are living here uh, in North America, and then the, we are dependent, our climate is actually dependent upon the, uh, uh, the respiration of these uh, massive rainforests that are down south. Uh, and they also happen to serve as a sink for the, for the carbon. Uh, there is more carbon stored in the in the trees than, 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 than many other places. So it's just, it's there are, they're really important, they serve many, many important uh, purposes for, for, for us, and yet they are disappearing at a very rapid rate. The, the, the world's forest cover is disappearing uh, for many of reasons. One of them is people need to live, they need to grow food, so they need to have agriculture, and basically a lot of the forest cover has been changed into agriculture uh, and, and, and cropland and plantations. And of course, there are uh, many of the forests are disappearing because of fires and other natural disasters. So, uh, as a, the um, so forests, by their natural growth, are able to pick up as much as about two billion tons of carbon uh, from the atmosphere each year. So that sort of tells you how useful they can be from the carbon uh, perspective. And two billion tons of carbon, uh, just to give you a sense, it's about as big as, is that amount is about as much as we emit from all fossil fuel emission due to the transportation sector. So all the carbon emission that happens from the cars, planes, trains, all, all the, the tra entire transportation sector, it's, it's equivalent to the, the amount of carbon that's absorbed by the, the forest just by the natural growth. And yet we lose about that much uh, 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 carbon into the atmosphere by simply uh, the, the, the degradation of these trees. So there's a lot of talk about uh, preserving the forest uh, for, for a number of reasons. Just among them, you know, carbon trading being one of them. And what they expect is that if, you, if you're able to put some cost on the carbon that's stored in these trees, uh, uh, and that, that cost could be as little as, as, as 20 to $30 uh, uh, per ton of carbon, you could save a lot of forests in, in the world. And, and to just give you an idea as to what that means in terms of uh, uh, comparative term, if you use biofuels to preserve, um, uh, uh, to, to basically reduce greenhouse emission, the cost of saving about a ton of carbon could be as much as a thousand dollars. So, so this is so the way of saving forests is much much cheaper than many many other many uh, basically preserving forests is perhaps one of the cheapest ways of, of addressing the, the carbon emission problem. So it's basically uh, it's understood that the, the forest can play a big big role uh, in, in this equation uh, of, uh, of reducing the carbon uh, emission, and yet the forests have not been a part of the, uh, the carbon trading protocol because the quantifiable knowledge about changes in the forest is critical uh, before you can in incorporate them uh, into the, uh, the, the carbon trading framework. So, uh, so there is uh, a big push right now in this direction of, of, of including them in, in the carbon trading, and one of the things that, that's really needed for that is, can you monitor the state of the forest? Because if we can, then we can sort of start paying countries for preserving forests, paying countries for replanting forests, we can give them credits for these things. So there's this program, program called RED, United Nations RED program, which basically is supposed to offer monetary payment for preservation of forests, and the RED stands for reduction of emission from forest degradation. Uh, 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 so this is a big program. So now, um, so the question is, how do we, uh, uh, what's, what's the state of the art in, in technology for monitoring uh, the forest, right? So 
this, this, this topic of uh, monitoring land cover uh, is, 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 is a very extensive research topic studied by a large community in remote sensing. And, and the traditional method for, for, for seeing if a certain part of the world has changed or not is, is, is based upon image comparison. That if you, you have the satellites, which are taking the pictures of the globe all the time, and if you can find two very good quality images of the same location from two different times, then by analyzing them, then you can figure out if, if something has changed or not. So for example, you're seeing here on, on, on the slide two different pictures uh, of, of this area from two, different lo from, two, uh, from two different times. And if you carefully analyze them, you can sort of see number one, they are the same, the images of the same location. Number two, one of them has more greenery than the other. That means depending on which one came first, you can tell whether uh, the vegetation increased or decreased there. So if you, if you examine the two images that are of good quality from two different locations, you can tell a lot about what changed and what did. So this has been the paradigm uh, for analysis that's used by uh, people in remote sensing. And, and this paradigm allows us to study changes in an area over a period of time. People, for example, would prepare maps of forest cover change over a period of five years. What happened in Indonesia between 2000 and 2005? Let's do the study. Let's study these maps and then figure out, aha, this much forest cover has, has changed from one uh, decade to the other or one uh, location to the other. But th this, this paradigm actually has a lot of limitations because for a number of reasons. One of them is that the high quality observations uh, that are needed for such comparisons are not very frequent in many parts of the world. So in some part of the tropics, it could take six months to a year or sometimes several years before you will get a good image. And the other thing is that if you are analyzing these images at two different times, the changes might happen outside those uh, windows. You cannot figure out when the change happened, what is the rate of the change, uh, and, and lots of other things. And then above all, uh, a lot of this analysis has to be supervised and requires training data and makes it unsuitable for global analysis. So, so this, there are a lot of limitations, even though this problem is of great interest, but the, the remote sensing community basically develops these change maps for localized areas and only for, for, for windows of time that are very specifically specified before time. And which, of course, doesn't make it quite right for monitoring uh, the state of the global ecosystem uh, on a much more of a continuous basis. An alternate way of doing the same thing could be that you use uh, the data, uh, a more, more continuous data from the satellite. So for example, uh, in, uh, in the 1990s, the, uh, the US government uh, started a program for, uh, basically they authorized this program for NASA to monitor the globe uh, at, at, at somewhat coarse resolution uh, from two different satellites, Aqua and Terra. And, and then they set these satellites uh, using the instrument called MODIS, uh, collects a lot of data about the globe. So every single location on the globe uh, where no matter where you are, uh, is basically observed by these satellites every single day. So if you look at the, the building, this area, your campus of UNCC, uh, this, this, this campus is basically pictured every single day by the satellite. And all of these information is stored, archived, processed, and uh, amazingly made available to the entire world, uh, free of charge, paid by US Congress. Uh, for scientific analysis, basically. So there is, uh, this data is, is uh, uh, and it's literally a multi-billion dollar program, and it's primarily used for scientific research. So, so using uh, this data that you're sort of seeing collected by the satellite in, in, in this big swaths of, uh, 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 that you're seeing uh, um, uh, on the globe, you can actually collect this data and process it in many, many different forms. And one of them that you're seeing here is this picture that you're seeing on the right side, and that picture is, is called the, the vegetation index of the globe. So you can build a picture like this, which sort of tells you how green the planet is at every location on the globe. And the location is defined in pixels, a small pixel. The pixel here is, is about as large as 250 meters. So basically, uh, the size of this building, a couple of size of a couple of these buildings would, would form one pixel. So each of those pixels has a greenery value and then you can sort of, have, you, you sort of collect the data and you, you have these images available effectively for each day. Okay? And once you have these images for each day, you can sort of construct for each location on the globe a time series which sort of tells you how the green 
the vegetation is up, is going up and down on each day. So for example, the trees are, uh, are becoming green outside because of spring. And if you look at the time series for, for, for Charlotte, you will see some of those variables coming up you know, in, in, in pretty much the same format. Once you have these, this data set, you can, you can analyze this data to look for changes uh, by, in the land cover or in the vegetation. And it opens up new possibilities because this data is very rich, uh, uh, very continuous. It's available uh, wall to wall for the entire globe and, and for every single location on the globe. And it allows you to sort of, uh, it offers the opportunity to detect a greater variety of changes uh, uh, and also understand the dynamics of the change. But of course, it, it opens up lots of challenges for research in computer science and data mining because the nature of the data is very different than what you typically collect in many, many other domains. For one thing, because the data is being collected from the satellite, there's a lot of issues about quality uh, because there are clouds, there are uh, angles of the satellite, there are angle of the sun that comes into play when you collect the data. And also there's a lot of variability in the vegetation and the nature uh, uh, which sort of makes this data very, very noisy. And I'm giving you some examples of the time series on the right side. And of course the data is massive, uh, but tens of billions of locations on the globe for just one variable, which means the, the data can be very, very large very soon as if you're analyzing on a global scale. So, um, and of course, uh, that opens up new interesting challenges in, uh, for research in computer science. The next slide is just to sort of show that there's a massive amount of work uh, in uh, time series change detection uh, in many, many uh, disciplines like statistics, signal processing, control theory, process controls, and so forth. But a lot of these areas actually don't uh, handle the type of characteristics that, that, that are common to the ecosystem data. So many of these techniques don't really work directly as it is. So uh, new sets of techniques have to be developed to, to, to work this kind of data. So what I'm talking about here is uh, some of the work done in our group on uh, novel uh, time series change reduction algorithms that are really spatiotemporal uh, uh, algorithms that can look at this uh, data and, uh, and look for a variety of changes. And there are, this, this is a broad research program with lots of different types of algorithms, but they can be grouped into two different categories. One is model change algorithm, which are basically segmentation-based approaches. And the other is prediction-based approaches in which you try to build a model of the time series and, and, and try to make prediction. And if the prediction doesn't match your model, then you use that information as, as, a, as a venue for change. Uh, so I'm going to sort of talk about, not without giving you much details of uh, these specific algorithms, but I'm going to talk about uh, the actual result uh, produced by uh, these techniques. So basically these techniques have allowed us to develop uh, the system. Uh, it's called ALERT, uh, stands for Automated Land Change Evaluation Reporting and Tracking System, which is really a planetary scale information system for the assessment of uh, ecosystem disturbances. And it looks for things like fires, droughts, floods, uh, any kind of changes to land cover like logging or deforestation or conversion to agriculture. And the idea is that once you have a system that um, uh, makes an inventory of all these things uh, in a real time mode, uh, you can do multiple things with them. You can use the system to quantify the carbon impact of these changes. So you help with the, the carbon budgeting of the, of the planet. And you can also use this as a step starting point for, uh, for further research into understanding the relationship of global climate variability and human activity to, uh, uh, to the changes in the ecosystem. Uh, and, and of course, a system like this uh, is, our intent is to make it uh, accessible over the web to the entire um, uh, society so people at large uh, have, a, have an understanding of what's going on uh, to their planet. So the system, uh, uh, this, um, this planetary skin platform was voted at the 50 best invention by uh, Time Magazine in, in, in 2009. And what I'm gonna show you is uh, just some sample results uh, from the system. What you're seeing here is, is, a, is a demonstration of the, of the sample of results on a global scale. Uh, and this is the first time uh, and anyone was able to produce a global history of, of changes in the ecosystem. So every time you see a dot uh, 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 on the globe coming and going, what you're seeing is a large area of the globe had vegetation, mostly forest, which either disappeared because of fires or disappeared because of deforestation or uh, conversion to agriculture or something. So for example, you see a lot of dots here in the South America, 
most of them are due to deforestation. You see a lot of dots in the Canada. Uh, a lot of them are because of forest fires and so forth. So you can sort of basically, if you watch this, you can see changes happening uh, uh, from many, many different uh, perspectives. One of the biggest changes that you see actually are in the northern hemisphere, in, in Canada and, and in Russia. So you see on the left side uh, is the, uh, the, the Russian uh, forest, and on the right side are the Alaska and the northern Canada. And as the climate has warmed in the last uh, 10 years, um, by a couple of degrees in, in, in these areas, uh, the winters have become shorter and um, not as cold. And as a result, the, the, the pine beetles, which would typically die off in the, in the harsh winters of Canada and in Siberia, have managed to survive for longer, which means they, they are able to, to infect the trees farther up north. And as a result, the, and when they infect the trees, the trees dry up. And when the winter, when the summer comes, then the trees catch fire. So uh, for the last 10 years, these areas, and you can see this is the animation over a 10 year period going from uh, 2000 to 2009, you see massive fires uh, erupting in these areas. And of course, most recent one in, in Russia uh, one year ago. And, and the consequence of, of, of these fires is that the Canadian forests now have now the distinction of being source of carbon as opposed to sink of carbon. Normally. Uh, even the Amazon rainforest, which by the, even though there, there's a huge amount of deforestation there, but they grow enough each year to actually absorb more carbon than, than, than from deforestation. But the Canadian forests over the last 10 years have become a net emitter of carbon as opposed to uh, a sink of carbon. And this is actually the, 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 the wrong kind of feedback uh, that uh, is impacting, that's coming from the climate change. It is warmer climate makes these trees burn, and as the trees burn, they release more carbon. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Uh, that's uh, uh, sort of progressing. And you can sort of see the dynamics of uh, uh, these, uh, the fires uh, because of this analysis, which is sort of, which is produced by data mining algorithms. Uh, this is uh, basically the, the, the in Canadian government actually has been keeping a pretty decent track of these fires because of these, the, 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 for the last 10 years. And, and this, this slide I'm just showing you is more of a, as a validation of the data mining research. So what you're seeing here on the slide is a bunch of blue patches. And each of these blue patch is, is a polygon constructed by area surveillance of the fire. And on the next slide, what I'm gonna show you is the, is the, the location identified by our data mining algorithm for, for damage to this ecosystem. And you can see the, the red areas are sitting right in the middle of those blue areas, so you can sort of uh, almost a perfect match. So this is, this is a very, very good evidence of uh, uh, validation here. Uh, Australia is another, another continent that has a big uh, uh, fire problem, a lot, lot of uh, forest fires there. And again, uh, the, the, they also maintain uh, uh, their polygon base for the, for the fires. It turns out the Australian ground truth is actually not as good because the, uh, it turns out that the algorithm, the, the, the locations identified by the algorithm are much much more precise than the, the ones that are maintained, main, maintained by uh, the Canadian government. So if you look at these polygons, you see the red locations, pink locations are the ones in which our algorithm matches the Australian uh, uh, database. Orange ones are the ones in which uh, uh, Australian um, polygons claim that there is a change, but our algorithm finds there's no change. And blue ones are the, the false positive. And it turns out if you look at the time series, you can see the red ones show the change in the time series and the, the, the yellow ones don't. So, so basically, it's, it's a way to sort of show that yes, the, the algorithms, data mining algorithms, and actually can improve the ground truth that's available uh, from these places. Uh, let me uh, skip this. Uh, this slide shows that you can actually look for uh, many, many different types of changes. This m bunch of these dots you're seeing in Canada happen to be from fire, but the, some of these points in the corner here are, are because of deforestation uh, due to logging. And you can see the time series for logging is much more uh, gradual uh, decrease over many, many years, as opposed to sudden drop that you see in, 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 the, in the fires. This is actually showing you the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, uh, which, which is home to uh, some of the largest rainforests in the world, and also some of the largest uh, deforestation that are happening 
uh, 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 in the world. And you see the little red patch of, of blue points on the, on the lower end. This is called the, um, the arc of deforestation, which, which is where most of the deforestation activity happens. Uh, and you can see the time series on the right side sort of showing you the, the departure and the, the greenery uh, by showing you uh, the damage in the, to the trees. Uh, and this animation, again, over a period of 10 years, gives you a sense of how the deforestation really happened. Uh, you can see the red spots growing around the, the arc. And then basically, you can sort of build a very uh, detailed history of exactly what happened to each patch of land and how it was deforested. Uh, you, and again, all measured by this, the algorithm that analyzed this global uh, satellite time series data. Now, Brazilians for the last 10 years have been very actively monitoring their forest space uh, because they're trying to preserve the forest. And they maintain the system called PRODES, uh, which is, which is uh, a system for monitoring deforestation in Brazilian Amazon. And, and it's, a, it's a multi hundred million dollar program that they have on a national level in which they, they again use the satellite data to sort of create these histories of what happened each year. So each year they would release uh, um, a set of polygons that this is how, what happened to our forest in the last one year. And then again, they're, they're trying to reduce the amount of deforestation each year. And it's considered to be the gold standard. And you can see this blue polygons that you're seeing here are constructed by the Brazilian uh, agency. And if you look at these uh, uh, yellow dots that are constructed by our algorithm, and you can see a pr very, very good match uh, between what we produce and what they produce. And again, our algorithms are not specific to Brazil, and they are uh, more global in nature. And then you can see the changes being captured. And some of the ch what, what this slide is showing is some of the changes captured by our algorithm, but not picked up by uh, uh, the, the produce, in the sense that if you're doing something uh, in, in an unscalable system, you can miss some changes. Uh, this is just uh, showing another uh, example of, of a deforestation uh, in Tanzania. This is a gold mine. Um, uh, this, this, which happens to be in an area which is considered uh, protected by United Nations. So it's, called, it's a UNEP protected zone. And, uh, and, and but the analysis picked up um, a whole bunch of points which sit right on top of this gold mine, which literally can, you can, you can by doing this analysis, you can pick up the entire dynamics of how this, uh, uh, this, this gold mine was constructed starting in 2002 and then uh, developed over a period of three years uh, to cover this whole area. Um, China, for example, has a very massive program for reforestation. Uh, and I just picked up one example to see over here, uh, uh, which is sort of you know, planting trees uh, in areas to grow. And you can see this, this uh, reforestation uh, in Guangtan Reservoir near uh, Beijing. And you can see this time series going up slowly. And again, this, by uh, writing the right kind of algorithms, you can look for, for these kind of changes as well. Uh, you can, again, detect many, many other kind of land cover changes, not just uh, uh, that relate to the forest. Anything that can be uh, looked at from the, anything that's visible from the, from the satellite in terms of vegetation or greenness can be picked up uh, uh, um, uh, from this time series analysis. So you can look at reforestation. We just talked about floods, expansions, and shrinkage of water bodies, changing agricultural practices, and so forth. So you see the damage from the hurricane uh, 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 in Houston and floods, more recent floods in, in, in Queensland. Uh, there's some, some of the examples we can, we can catch. But then here is a, here is a much more concrete example of uh, 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 being picked up by the satellite data. So this, this is Lake Chad is one of the largest lakes in, Niger in, in Africa, which actually covers four different countries. And this lake has been shrinking over the last 50 years for a number of reasons, partly because of some strange shift in the climate. In that region, the rainfall has been uh, uh, scarce. And the other thing is that people use water uh, from rivers for agriculture. Uh, then it sort of impacts the lakes that, that are fed by the, by the rivers. So these lakes have been shrinking. And when the lake shrink, then vegetation sprouts up on the edges of the lake. And you can see the time series uh, on the upper side to reflect that lake shrinkage. So you can, by, by doing the proper analysis of the time series, you can figure out what portions of the, the land uh, had a shrinkage in the lake. Now, for the last four or five years, the countries that are surrounding this lake have become very concerned. So they have started redirecting water from the rivers into the lake. So the part of the lakes are now growing. And you can catch that by the reverse change in the time series on the other side. So you can, you can see this analysis for many, many different purposes, not just for the preservation of forest. 
Uh, this is about looking at the damage from hurricanes. So you see the whole bunch of points on the southern coast of uh, United States, and all of those points are clustered near um, New Orleans. And if you look at them close by, you see all those uh, squared, uh, the, the, cir the circles actually reflect the damage to the vegetation that happened. Uh, and you see the time series going down. This is the annual time series starting in 2000. And you can see the, well, the year that it went down is 2005. If some of you who went to data mining conference 2005, ICDM was in, in Houston, and then it had to be moved. Uh, I was in New Orleans, it had to be moved to Houston. And that's, you can sort of catch the, the, not only the location of the hurricane, but more importantly, the amount of damage done to the vegetation because of the hurricane. You can very precisely map which areas were damaged, which areas were not, and how much, and for how long. And it sort of helps you with, with planning. Uh, I'm gonna skip some, since running out of time, you know, this is about uh, f detecting flood. Let me just mention this very, very briefly. Uh, this is about agriculture monitoring for global food security. Again, uh, the same technology that's used for monitoring forests can be used for looking at changes in the agric agricultural practices. Uh, and if you, um, and, that, and that's gonna become even more important as, as the food demand is gonna increase uh, in the next 30 years because of increasing population and an improvement in people's lifestyle or the changes in people's lifestyle. And that means the, the policymakers and the NGOs require capabilities to manage food production um, uh, without having uh, environmental impact. Just the, the massive fires in Russia last, last year and then the, and the, uh, the summer, about hot summers, reduced the, 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 the wheat production in Russia, which means as a result, they have caused big spikes in the, in the, in the prices of uh, wheat uh, futures. And then people don't know whether they should plant more wheat or less wheat because if they plant too much, then the, uh, the, the prices would go down too much. And if you plant too little, people will go hungry. So it's, it's always the, uh, the sketch 22. So but using the same technology, you can have a much, much, potentially much better handle on what's going on globally in terms of uh, agriculture planting and how you adapt to it. And what you're showing, what, what I'm showing you here is on the right side is a time series from a location in Zambia, which actually shows that around 2004, a farm that was extremely productive, and again, this is gonna be hard for you to figure out why, but you see the cycles going up and down each year twice, very, very productive farm then was, became abandoned uh, in, in 2005 and 2006. And it happened as a result of uh, a, a, a decision made by the government uh, in Zimbabwe to basically take the farm, the, 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 the large holdings of the farm that were uh, with, uh, from the 280 big farmers, and they basically gave them away to small farmers. And as a result, these big farmers had massive infrastructure to, to do the farming. And then when these farms were given away to the small farmers, they were not able to farm, use, use the farms effectively. So, uh, so Zimbabwe, which used to be the bread basket of Africa uh, until then, uh, is now going through food shortages and droughts and, 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 and hunger and they're importing food and it's really creating a lot of problem. And of course the president uh, of Zimbabwe does not, uh, does not accept that his decision to, to, to re uh, um, you know, do the farm, uh, uh, the allotment was the cause for it. But using this technology, you can actually figure out exactly which parcel of land changed and how much productivity on each year. So you can sort of create some very quantifiable uh, knowledge from it. So let me uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, give you a whole bunch of examples of what you can do with this monitoring of, 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 of the globe. So this, this, all of this can be used in many, many different ways. And one of them, of course, is risk analysis. That is, what's happening to the globe? What, what's happening to vegetation systems? Which could be used for input into the, uh, the carbon trading. Or more recently, into the United Nations Red Program uh, for protecting forests. Uh, it, it, of course, helps policymakers and public at large. And it can also uh, help with the climate change research in the sense of figuring out what is the impact of climate change on ecosystem and what is the relationship of uh, 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 things like biofuel uh, dynamics uh, uh, to deforestation. And on the, this, I don't have time to show this video, but this is a, a more of a uh, demonstration of the platform, of the alert platform that we, we intend to make public, uh, um, which allows you to sort of query the entire data as I was sort of showing you and look at the different time series and then look at uh, the, uh, the information about each event and, and what's, what, what was the climate during that time and uh, what are the different locations. Uh, but the, um, 
the system that I just uh, showed you was demonstrated at, uh, at the Cancun Climate Change Summit in December. We, we sort of basically uh, showed the system in December, and The Economist published the story uh, a week after that, in the middle of December, as, as the, uh, as that they sort, of, they sort of said that our group has the technology uh, to, to basically seeing the world uh, for the, the changes in the forest. Actually, the article is much more positive than reality in the sense it claims that we have solved the problem, but we, we really are uh, actively uh, making progress. But basically, it sort of says the data mining algorithm that we have developed really uh, uh, is able to handle this issue of monitoring the global forest. But it was nice uh, uh, support from, uh, from this uh, organization. Um, Actually, since I have only about 10 minutes, I'm going to skip some of these slides and just talk about one more uh, topic, which is the second um, uh, uh, case study I wanted to sort of mention to you about, and which is understanding climate change uh, uh, using uh, uh, computer science-based approaches. So before that, I want to sort of give you a sense of how people do climate change research right now. So most of this research is done using these physics-based models, which simulate uh, uh, the climate of the globe. So you see that uh, global picture there. Uh, the globe is basically in three dimensions. Uh, uh, you, you, you basically come up, construct a grid, a 3D grid of the globe. And the, depending on how much computing power you have, the grid can be fine or, 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 or coarse. And this grid tends to be of the order of, each element of the grid happens to be of the order of several hundred kilometers in each, each, each dimension. And then people develop uh, the parametrization for, uh, for, for physics, for, for, the, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for the physical behavior of these uh, different atmospheric elements. And then these models then uh, try to, to predict as to what happens uh, to the atmosphere. So the way the scientific basic, scientists basically work with the GCMs is they make prediction on, they basically try to simulate the, 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 the temperature, uh, they, they, they simulate the, the climate for the, for the globe. And one of the ways that this work is used is, is seen on the right-hand side. If you look at the right-hand side picture, the black line on that, on that graphic is the t average temperature of the globe over a period of last 100 years uh, going back to 19, uh, uh, 1880. And you can see that black line goes up and down, but it has, has, a, it has a tendency to go up pretty rapidly in the last 50 years. So this is what they say when the scientists say that the globe has been warming in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Now, if you look at the, the red line right above it, it's, it's, it's fluctuating pretty much the same way, but it's going up. Now, this red line is actually a result of an ensemble of these GCMs that you're seeing here, the general circulation models, right? And there are a couple of dozen general circulation models that are developed by different research labs around the world. And, um, and, the, and, and these are some of the most prominent models and basically, the, if you look at the average of those results, or the median of those results, you see that it tracks pretty good uh, in terms of uh, what the, you see in the observation. And this model, the red line assumes that there is a greenhouse gas emission is, is, is the same rate as we are seeing in the last 50 years. So when they say the physics, basically the physics scientists sort of say, look, our research shows that the global has been warming, and it's warming because of human action, because, because if I incorporate the greenhouse gases, my red line matches the, the, the black line. But if I do not incorporate the greenhouse gases in the model, then my model predicts the operation of the blue line, which means most of these models say the Earth should be cooling. And of course, Earth is not cooling, which means the, uh, the, the, the warming that you're seeing is explained only by the greenhouse gases. So this is the extent of what the physical scientists can do. Now on the right-hand side, over, uh, on, on the left-hand side here, at the lower curve over here, you're seeing projection beyond 2000, or going all the way up to 2100. Now, what, what they're saying is that the, the same models then can be used to say, well, we have warmed up about half a degree the last 50 years. Now, if we continue going like this under different scenarios, we might go up to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, depending upon what's going to be our energy consumption, fossil fuel consumption, and so forth. So, so this is the extent of what, the, what the, the, the traditional technology is able to tell the society. But this is extremely inadequate for people who want to do the planning. Okay? Because if you live in uh, Charlotte, what, what you really don't care about is that the, the temperature is going to go by half a degree or one degree or two degree. You really worry about what will happen to us. You know, how do we plan for it? Right? And, and that's where things get very murky. And, uh, and, and, and basically, the physics-based models are very good in telling something about 
things like temperature uh, or the certain, certain entropy variable uh, for which they can make reasonably reliable production, uh, prediction, but they provide least reliable prediction for things that are really important for us. So just to give an example, and this is something very close to your home, here are the four, the, the, uh, to the right-hand corner, what you're seeing here, are the four different projections. I showed you there are about 24 different models, right? Uh, but the, 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 the scientists use globally. So the, the, the four different pictures that you're seeing there are for the prediction for the amount of water pr precipitation and any location will have, right? This is the, actually the difference between the precipitation and, and evapotranspiration. So it, it, if, if blue means that there will be a drought and the red means it will be a flood, I mean there will be more water, right? So if you live in North Carolina, two of these models are saying that it's going to be less water as the, as the, as the globe warms up. Other two models are saying there will be more water, there will be more rain, right? So you sort of say, well, you know, how do I plan for it? You know, and, and does it mean anything, right? You know, in the sense that, can I trust anything? So, so a lot of these models actually diverge uh, for variables that are of really great interest, right? So they are in agreement that overall the globe is going to warm up. But in terms of predicting on a regional basis, they don't do a very good job, okay? They won't tell you, for example, from these models about what will happen to the hurricanes. You can't use the GCM models to make predictions on the frequency of hurricanes or the intensity of hurricanes, which is, which is perhaps even more important for people living in the coastal areas. So, so we have, so, so basically uh, this, this quotation in the middle, the red quotation, is from the Nature article in 2010, which came out on the time when they were talking very extensively about this climate gate, right? That there's, there's a lot of controversy about climate, but it's actually not about the fact that the globe is warming, but it's about what will happen to us. You know, what, what, what would the change in the climate do? So the sad truth of climate science is that the most crucial information is the least reliable one. That is what we really need for p policy planning is the one for which we have least reliable uh, models uh, to make prediction on. So this NSF expedition project that uh, we just started on last summer uh, is, is about building a, a new and, and transformative data-driven approach that is supposed to build on top of physics-based models because they, they provide a lot of information, but it's basically supposed to complement the traditional techniques uh, and, and to help us improve the prediction of impact of climate change. So this is a multidisciplinary team uh, and which involves uh, two other universities from North Carolina, uh, NC State uh, and uh, uh, North Carolina a and as well as Oak Ridge National Lab, NASA, and uh, Northwestern and, and, and University of Tennessee. So this is a very, very large uh, uh, collaborative team uh, and, and almost half the team members happen to be climate scientists and other half computer scientists. And the idea is to, so basically how do we use the, uh, the research in computer science on areas like complex networks, predictive modeling, and uh, relationship mining and so forth. And then the intent is to be able to sort of uh, provide new understanding of the impact of climate change. And, and, uh, and, and we have stated in our project that our success is gonna be to see the output of this project uh, being included and the, uh, the IPCC um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, reports. And I, I'm really out of time, but I'll just give you in, in two or three minutes just a sense of, uh, of in, in this very large project, there are a lot of different things going on, but I'm just gonna give you one a small sample uh, of, of what a data guided analysis could do. And uh, to just give you a sense of what, what that is, but just let me, let me sort of introduce this concept of dipole to you. So in climate, the dipoles are teleconnections. The whole global climate actually is interconnected. So if you look at this red point on, on, on the globe, which, which right next to Tahiti, and other red points, which is right in, in Australia, right? So these are the two points on the globe, right? Now the time series over here on the left side, you're seeing the red time series and the blue time series. There happen to be pressure time series for the same location. Actually, there are deviation of F pressure from the average, expected average. You can see sometimes they go in up or down direction, right? And sometimes, of course, they, they diverge from each other. Now, this combination is called a dipole. That is, there are two locations. One is going up and other is going down at the same time. And when one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. So this is a dipole. And if I take the difference of these two, this looks like this. Basically, this is the right picture is just a simple subtraction of the first one. So dipole could be in the red phase or the blue phase. Now, this is actually a very famous dipole. Everybody knows about it, even though you don't know. How many of, how, how many of you have heard of the El Nino? Right? El Nino. So this is the El Nino dipole. So when it is red, it's El Nino. When it's blue, it's La Nina. 
right now we're in the La Nina phase, which is, which is why the winters are pretty hard. Maybe you don't feel it, but people up north feel it a lot more, right? So this is just one dipole. Similarly, there, there's another dipole called NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation, which happens to be the difference between two pressures in North Atlantic, uh, Upper North Atlantic and Down South Atlantic. So you see the left dipole on the left side is the, the El Nino dipole. The right one is the NAO dipole. And these two dipoles actually interact even more strongly. The, re the reason the winters this year are so harsh in, in, in the entire North America is because we are in the blue phase of this dipole and one of the bad phase of that dipole. So the, one of, the, of the four combination, one combination is deadly, right? And that's what is happening. You know, basically, literally, when the dipole uh, changes, uh, the weather becomes better, right? So, so this, this sort of tells you how important these dipoles are. Now, these dipoles actually impact a lot of different things. That is, you can sort of take this dipole, which is time series, and look at the correlation of temperature on the land, on, on, on the whole world, and you can sort of see, you can get a correlation map, and you can figure out, aha, you know, if I look at a 60-year time series, any time this dipole changes shape, you can see some parts being warmer, sometimes some parts being colder. And this is just a simple example, but the, the El Nino has impact on the precipitation, on monsoons, on, uh, on, on, on floods, and a lot of, lot of things all over the world. And same thing with the other dipole. But these are just two examples of dipoles. There are lots of other climate indices that scientists have discovered by observation over the period of last 100 years or 150 years. And most of them have been uh, observed by some very uh, painful uh, systematic experimentation. And some of them don't even have physical interpretation. Some of them, they sort of take the large swath of the global data and they will do principal component analysis and, and, and sort of use that value as, as, as a measure of the index. Now what this allows us to do, what the, what the availability of this data allows us to do is think of new approaches to find these dipole phenomena. So uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, in the next two minutes, I'm going to wrap up since I know we are out of time. Uh, what this, this is talking about, this slide is talking about is an approach of converting this global climate data into a graph. And once you have a graph, then you can manipulate the graph and, and, and figure out patterns in it, which can result and in, in turn give you this dipole. So if you take this gridded uh, globe here, I can make a node for each grid point of the globe. So that it becomes a graph and which has as many nodes as number of grid points. And then between two nodes, I can put an edge that reflects the relationship between those time series. And one traditional technique people do is take the time series and take a straight correlation and put that as an edge. And once you have a graph, then you can do a lot of wonderful things with it. Okay? And people started studying the, this, this graph-based interpretation of climate phenomena about, since about 10 years ago. And, you know, including our group uh, and many other groups have studied it over the last 10 years. But more recently, in the context of this project, what we have done is we have taken this network and we have tried to figure out if we can find dipoles out of it. And it turns out if you look at the negatively correlated edges, it, it gives you the opportunity to find these dipoles. And there are a lot of uh, different steps that go into it that I'm not going to go into it, but I'm just going to show you this slide to show you that if you take the global climate data, and you go through this multiple uh, steps of finding regions that are stable and then they can serve as dipoles. You actually can find these edges between different regions and those regions actually correspond to the well-known dipoles like the SOI which corresponds to El Nino and AO for which there is no physical interpretation available until uh, this thing is found. And if you go deeper into this dipole structure you can find more, you can find more and so forth. Now, the, big, the, the multiple advantages of, uh, of, of this kind of analysis, one of them is that these dipoles that we are finding from data actually happen to be better than the one that climate scientists have been studying in a static mode. And this slide shows that on the left side you see the static dipoles that, that the climate scientists study. And the, on the right side you see the dynamic dipole that's, that's found by the data mining algorithm. And both of these slides is trying to show you the relationship with the land variables. And you can see the right picture is much more dark than the left picture. Right picture is very similar to the left picture, but much more dark. That means you have much stronger relationship with the climate, with the climate on the land. So it means it has much greater predictive power uh, than the static dipole. Same thing goes for this other uh, picture here. But more importantly, you can actually now start studying this output of these general circulation models, which people sort of say, well, I have 24 models, and I'm just going to look at average of each one of them. And if, if two of them say Atlanta is going to be uh, wet and two of them say uh, Atlanta is going to be dry, well, 
I can't do anything, right? Now I can go back and sort of see, well, you know, I, I, I can go back and see what is the dipole structure in these models. And it turns out the dipole structure of these uh, 24 different models are actually quite different from each other. Some of them are able to reproduce the well-known climate indices, some of them don't, and which sort of means that some of the ones that don't might be uh, suspect in the sense they may not be as predictive uh, as other ones. So for example, in this one, one of these, uh, 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 the one on the left side, predict, incorporates El Nino over the right, on the right side, it does not. So obviously one of them is more uh, 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 reliable than the other one. You can basically look at the relationship in this dipole structure in the hindcast data, which means in the current duration, and the forecast data, which is looking at 100 years from now. So you can sort of see what would happen to the climate system and its states today versus 100 years. And what is each model telling us about uh, uh, where we are today and where we are going to be next year. So there are lots of very interesting scientific questions we can answer beyond saying, okay, let me take the average of these 24 models and see if they agree or not. So uh, this is just sort of a sample of what we can do with this analysis. And as I said, let me, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here and just end with the message that these data-driven methods hold great promise for understanding the, the, the climate and ecosystem data. Uh, and, and of course, the nature of these data sets offer numerous opportunities and challenges for us in computer science and certainly data mining. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>